establishment could come down on you like that. I really didn't. None of us did. We thought that England was a place where you could be slightly strange and eccentric, but you were okay. I mean, we were all completely appalled. This is not how I or Keith or Mick were brought up to think of as British justice, I can tell you. The Stones drug bust in February 1967, and the subsequent drug trial in June of that year, is a well-known chapter of pop culture from the 60s. There was a dead silence as the judge added, you will go to prison for one year, and Richard, who earlier had talked in his evidence of what he called petty morals, went down to the cells without expression. Jagger was sentenced to three months imprisonment for possession of four amphetamine tablets, and Richards was found guilty of allowing cannabis to be smoked on his property and sentenced to one year in prison. Jagger was taken to Brixton Prison, and Richards to Wormwood Scrubs. Both were released on bail the next day pending appeal. Art dealer Robert Fraser, who was also at Keith Richards' home when the drug raid took place, received a year and did not appeal. At the time, it seemed obvious to everyone, including the establishment, that the sentences imposed upon him were completely out of proportion to the offences committed. But how did the music scene and society in general react to their convictions? Let's find out. The first band to publicly react against the Stones' conviction was The Who. The band sent a statement to the press that read, The Who consider that Mick Jagger and Keith Richards have been treated as scapegoats for the drug problem. And as a protest against the savage sentences imposed on him at Chichester yesterday, The Who are issuing today the first of a series of Jagger Richards songs to keep their work before the public until they are again free to record themselves. The result was a single featuring the songs Under My Thumb and The Last Time. The New Musical Express reported. The group plans to donate royalties from the disc towards assisting Jagger and Richard's legal costs. In order to make the record, the group suspended plans to cut their follow-up single, which will now be completed in New York this weekend. A few days later, Paul McCartney and Jimi Hendrix also shared their views on the drug sentences. McCartney commented, It's a terrible pity that people still think that by spanking children, you can stop them doing things. The best way to stop kids smoking at school is to let them smoke. I remember that we all wanted to try it and not be left out, so we went behind an outbuilding for a puff. When no one seemed to care, we soon gave it up of our own account. Trouble today is an ignorance of what it's all about. Everyone's frightened of things they know nothing about. Paul added, maybe we'll help the Stones with some royalties if they need it. Even though McCartney didn't mention it in the interview, George Harrison was also present at Keith Richards' home the night of the drug bust. And I was there very late, three or four in the morning, and then when I left, they were all busted and put in jail. So in the newspaper it said, another internationally famous pop star escaped moments before the net closed in, which just goes to show they weren't really ready to bust a beetle at that point in time. They worked their way up from Donovan up through the Rolling Stones and they waited to get the Beatles later. Jimi Hendrix commented, The Stones should be judged only by their musical ability. All this talk of a pop star's responsibility is nonsense. People should realize that a cat is human too and wants a private life. This pop business is so much harder than people think. It's nerve-wracking and mind-bending. The people who write the articles really know what they want, more or less. And so they write, oh, the Rolling Stones are a load of yobs, and everyone's very prepared to believe it. I really don't care whether they think we're a load of yobs or not. I mean, the only thing I've got against now establishment is that I don't like its rules, and so these are mine. A big concert was also planned to show support for the Stones. Disc magazine reported, Mammoth Rolling Stones charity concert, is to be staged at London's Alexandra Palace on September 8, when many of the country's top groups will make unpaid appearances to show support and sympathy for the Stones. Pink Floyd, Procol Harum and Denny Lane have already confirmed appearances. The Stones themselves will appear pending the results of the joint appeals by Keith Richards and Mick Jagger against their prison sentences of one year and three months respectively, which are being heard on July 31. 
all artists booked for the Alexandra Palace concert will be paid a fee which in turn will be donated to charity. According to Disc Magazine, the concert was going to be organized by Ian Ross, the owner of a firm which made mod gear. Other organizers would be the director of Pirate Station Radio Caroline, along with recording manager Denny Cordell. Ian Ross commented, This case has been a showdown between the establishment and the youth of the country, and I think it would be helpful to retaliate by a peaceful demonstration. The idea is a vast concert to raise money and send flowers to the judge with a message of forgiveness and a suggestion perhaps, that he should read the Sermon on the Mount to himself. That same week, journalist Bob Farmer wrote an article about how young London reacted to the sentences. The journalist spoke about the big show that was supposed to take place at Alexandra Palace, and also reported on the demonstrations that had been emerging against the drug sentences. The journalist also wrote about how Carnaby street shops were taking advantage of the sentences in order to make a quick buck. Bob Farmer reported, By Friday evening, Carnaby Street had started cashing in. Lord Kitchener's valet started displaying sets of handcuffs in their window with an invitation that read, Be faithful with a pair of Jagger links. The only half dozen available were sold out by Saturday at one quid a pair. On Saturday, a salesman said that they were arranging to get some more. At the time, many people wondered why Stone's manager Andrew Oldham was nowhere to be found when it seemed obvious that his job would have been to devise a strategy, hire the proper legal and public relations firms, and defuse the situation. Oldham actually travelled to the United States to avoid possible arrest himself. Several years later, his business partner Tony Calder said, I never saw a man pack his bag so quickly, he was terrified. Oldham later commented, I was already not dealing with a completely full deck. But if you have five policemen in your house, you've got a good reason to think you're going to end up in jail, so I just left the country. The Stones felt that Oldham had acted like a coward, and this marked the end of their relationship with the manager. When Oldham visited the band in the studio a few months later while they were recording the Satanic Majesties album, it seemed obvious that the Stones no longer wanted to have him around. Oldham just left the studio and never came back. Not surprisingly, underground newspaper International Times also wrote extensively about Jagger and Richard's convictions. Drug raids weren't anything new to the International Times. The newspaper's offices had been raided several times. And one of its editors, John Hoppy Hopkins, who was also the co-founder of the UFO Club along with Joe Boyd, was serving time in prison for keeping premises for the smoking of cannabis and possession of cannabis. The International Times complained about the national newspapers not reporting on the police violence taking place during most of the peaceful demonstrations against the Stones' sentences. The International Times reported, On June 29, the police tried to induce violence by turning dogs on peaceful demonstrators outside the news of the World Building. The demonstrations continued till early morning and six people were arrested. At night, approximately 2,000 people from various West End clubs, gathered in Piccadilly to demonstrate. Again, the police used dogs against the crowd and at least one demonstrator was badly bitten. The same day, the Angry Arts Festival publicly disassociated itself from performers who wished to make protests against the sentences. Arthur Brown and the Deviants refused to play on the festival. On July 1, the third demonstration took place outside the news of the World Building. The police became very aggressive and deviant singer Mick Farron was beaten up by policemen. John Hoppy Hopkins' girlfriend Susie Cream Cheese staged a sit-down and was arrested along with six or seven other people. The pirate radio station spent most of the day broadcasting Rolling Stones records. On the other side of the Atlantic, New York hippies demonstrated outside the British Embassy. The following day, Stone's records were broadcasted during intervals at the Cream and John Mayall show at the Savile Theatre in London. In his performed garden show at Radio London, John Peel broadcasted an hour of Stone's records and dedicated a Mothers of Invention song to Susie Cream Cheese. So there you have it, those are the Velvet Grunderground, with, uh, without Nico actually on that one, and uh, that was called European Sun to Delmore Shorts and we'll be playing bits of that during the next couple of weeks in the Perfume Garden. Another one of the new LPs that I have got is by the Mothers of Invention, and the fourth bit, which will be the last bit that we can play, is the Son of Susie Cream Cheese, 
and we play some more of it tomorrow. So Susie, I hope you're listening, love, and understand she's in trouble too now, as well as Hoppy, for trying to defend a few of our basic freedoms. So here we go, Mothers of Invention. In the end, when the Court of Appeal reviewed the case, what persuaded the judges to look skeptically at the original sentences, was an opinion piece published in one of the pillars of the establishment, the Times newspaper. The editorial, written by William Rees Mogg, surprised most of its readers. Who breaks a butterfly on a wheel? One has to ask, how it is that this technical offence was thought to deserve the penalty of imprisonment? The normal penalty is probation. Several years later, some sources claimed that Rees Mogg was so concerned about the emerging counterculture movement in Britain that he wrote the editorial with the intention of turning Jagger into a sort of intermediary figure between the counterculture and the establishment. If we take a closer look at his editorial, the journalist only focused on Jagger's three month conviction and never mentioned Keith Richards or Robert Fraser's sentence, so there could be some truth to that. A few days after his drug charge was overturned, Jagger agreed to be interviewed by the journalist on the World in Action television special, and Rhys Mogg probably thought he had achieved his goal. However, just three weeks later, the Stones shot a promotional film for their new single We Love You. The film was based on the trial of Oscar Wilde. Rhys Mogg, who was a Catholic moralist who often spoke out against homosexuals, was completely disgusted by the promotional film, and felt that the Stones were laughing in his face. The sarcastic We Love You chants from the song probably resonated in his head for the remainder of the year. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.